And so now we'll go to the Wii Ushki, like you said, and the introduction. So if you'll introduce yourselves and maybe before I know you as who you are by your name, I know your spirit and your spirit knows me because we're a spiritual people. And so our spirits have always known each other. But in this human form, we have to do things like this. But we all know each other. So all the time in Lakota, we always start to the left. And so um, introduce yourself. How do you want them to introduce themselves? And the Maybe you okay. can, t uh, sometimes in this little setting, sometimes uh, uh, we have to have our, uh, um, have that Lakota mindset, so mm. to say. Maybe you want to tell your, 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 the, one, the name that you were given at the uh, Thruhuka. Yeah, and, and we'll keep it at uh, less than three minutes. Because if you were all Lakota speakers, we would be here all day with just introductions. Uh -huh. Because because they tell where they come from all the way back. And being at the <laughs> tribal council meetings with the communities, that's how it is. We go in and we don't even get past introductions on the first day. <laughs> but that's how it is, you know, so we'll put a limit on it. Okay, so tell me who you are. Um, tell me um, what your goal is and what you would like out of this session. Okay? And if you have something that your spirit moves you to tell us, Please do that too, because we're all teachers here, every one of us. You came from a sacred place with some messages for us, but this white man's education has kept you from that. And so today, you know, when you, when you tell me who you are, please call your name four times so you bring your spirit with you, okay? Um, my name is Darren Janice. Mm. So I said two more times on Darren Janice, Darren Janice, Darren Janice. Is that four? Yep. Okay, good. And um, I'm just, I'm basically here to listen to you share your knowledge and your wisdom. Mm -hmm. right. so, mm -hmm. so you're going to be SpongeBob today. Huh? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Mariah Bravo. Okay. Two more times. Mariah Bravo, Mariah Bravo, Mariah Bravo. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what my goal is, like, mm -hmm. um, in this class or just... In your life. Oh, um, um, well, to get through and to graduate college in hopefully four years. Okay, good. And to get a good job and stuff. All right. And I hope to learn new things about my culture in this class today. Mm-hmm. Who's your mom, Carol? <coughs> uh, that's my grandma. Oh, your grandma, okay. Yeah. Uh, we go all the way back to Pankiskawakpa, Teoshpai. That's a white shell community in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Yeah, yeah. I know your family. <laughs> Sandy's your grandma too. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Roman White Calf. Roman White Calf. Roman White Calf. One more. Roman White Calf. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my goal is to finish school and try to make a bright future and I'll try to um, make a life for myself. Mm -hmm. a good one, anyway. So, um, and I'd like to just hear the I'd like to hear the knowledge that you have to uh -huh. say. And, Learn something new. So. Okay, that's My name is Devin Braveheart. Devin Braveheart. Devin Braveheart. Devin Braveheart. Oh, yeah. um, I'm working to be the best computer tech that the world's ever seen. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I know how to take them apart, put them back together, and start over again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, that. That 
computer itself has a spirit too, so always smudge it and mm -hmm. so you don't get into the bad part of it. Makoche yup dechawi, makoche yup dechawi, makoche yup dechawi, mako yup dechawi echale. I bet to get a little one on. You can let in one spell I got here, me, uh, Uchasha Kiha, uh, Oake. Naham, um, one spell I got here, Waglusta, my chin, Hetchel, uh, Miglusta Kiha, Woyawa, Wakanja, Kiwichak, Nahetna, Kewa, she will hack the Chassi Teklashka L in Master's Program Oapa, Mitakoya, I see. Um, my name is Rian Cooney. Rian Cooney. Rian Cooney. Rian Cooney. Mm -hmm. um, my goal is to get my degree in education. Mm -hmm. Future teacher, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Good. Good. We need you, so mm -hmm. stick with it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeannie Briggs Bunny. Jeannie Briggs Bunny. Jeannie Briggs Bunny. Jeannie Briggs Bunny. Hi, yeah. And my goal is to get my education in social work. And getting your education, so what are you majoring in? And what are you, what are you planning after you get your diploma? We have a bachelor's in social work. Oh, cool. Yeah, we need social workers. Excellent. Watch that. Um, Brenda Yellowboy, Brenda Yellowboy, Brenda Yellowboy, Brenda Yellowboy. Oh, yeah. My goal is to graduate been three years with my degree in business administration. Oh yeah, that's good. And you'll be managing something at the business level. Huh? Yeah. And uh, your own business or helping the tribe? Probably my own business. Okay, good. <laughs> um, my name is Mariah Poirier, Mariah Poirier, Mariah Poirier, Mariah Poirier. Oh yeah. Um, my goal is to gra graduate college and work at the hospital. I, uh, so, who, what family do you come from? The one from Alliance, Nebraska? Um, uh, Mike and Mary? No. No? Okay. The one's from... Marianne? Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. All right. Yeah, one of them in our class, too. Um, <laughs> your sister? Yeah. Okay. Cool. <coughs> Great. My name is Isaiah Eagleman. Isaiah Eagleman. Isaiah Eagleman. I see how you went. Okay. My goal is to graduate college, uh -huh. buy a big house, and be able to buy nice things. Uh -huh. So Isaiah, what yeomans are you from? Rosebud. Rosebud. Okay. Yeah. There's some yeomans that are live in Alliance, Nebraska, too, that they've all passed on, except for, I think, the mom's still alive and uh, one of her daughters. Yeah. So maybe you're related to them. Who knows? Okay. My name is Jamie Hudspeth, Jamie Hudspeth, Jamie Hudspeth, Jamie Hudspeth. Hi, yeah. And my goal is to just graduate and finish my degree and just look happy life. Try to make oh, others happy. Right. Okay, watch that. My name is Adam Waters, Adam mm -hmm. Waters, Adam Waters, Adam Waters. Hi, yeah. And my goal in life is to grow spiritually, mentally, physically. Okay. <coughs> My name is Maria Kilkill Indian. Maria Kilkill Indian. Maria Kilkill Indian. Maria Kilkill Indian. I recently got married. Oh. Mm -hmm. So that's my new name. Trying to get used to it. My so what Kilkill Indian did you marry? Samuel Kilkill Indian. Oh really? Where's he from? Um, he's my great mm. Samuel Kilkill Indian. Is my grandfather, so this must be one of the grandsons. Huh? Well, welcome to the family. Thank you. That's on my mom's side. <laughs> um, my goal is to finish my business degree and start my own business. Oh, yeah. Okay. My name is John Garnier. John Garnier. John Garnier. John Garnier. Oh, yeah. And I plan on finishing an education to get my diploma and become a basketball or a baseball coach. Cool, watch that. All right. It was Ben Red Club, Ben Red Club, Ben Red Club, Ben Red Club. Oh, hi, yeah. My goal is to graduate my business degree, start my own business up, mm -hmm. and help a lot of kids around here get them off the streets and stuff. 
And I plan on growing spiritually and speaking fluently our language. Yeah. Learn more about our ways. I know some, but I could learn more. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What's that? I'm Ling Yang Man of Fearless Horses. 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 Yeah. My goal is to do my basics here, go on to bigger college and study political science, and then move into politics. Yeah, watch that. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Okay. Well, I'm really proud of all of you for for coming back to get your education because that's what your ancestors wanted. They want you to learn this Washichu way of education well because with that knowledge, you're going to defend our people. You're going to strengthen our people. You're going to encourage our people. And so one of the values that your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents taught you was the helping behavior, to be helpful. How many of you were taught that? Wa'okya. How many of you were taught that, to be helpful? Okay, I noticed that when I came in, someone opened it, a young man opened the door for me. That's being helpful. I do a lot of the parenting classes on this reservation since 1990. First class was in Porcupine, and it was all in Lakota, because they were all Lakota speakers. And one of the things, as I moved further, closer to Pine Ridge, one of the things the parents always told me was, we want our children to learn to respect their elders. And probably hear those children today. And so I said, well, you need to show them. You need to show them by modeling how you respect your parents, because those are their grandparents. And how you treat them is how they're going to treat their elders. So it's actually modeling that. Our people are not, <coughs> the future culture is words of, they're, they're words, you know. And everything here is about words, you know, this school that they're teaching, Washington language, everything is in their language. Everything is about how they think. And so that what our ancestors didn't want is happening still today. But you can make that choice to change, change that by remaining who you are as Lakota people. <coughs> you know, sometimes we get caught up so much into the bright lights of mainstream culture that we forget who we are as Lakota people. Okay, so you need to keep who you are. Throughout your whole educational process, keep who you are. And when you do that, you're going to have that wiyukchong, that world view. Even though you don't speak the language, if you remain who you are, you remain close to that spirit of who you are and practice, live that spirituality, then call your name four times, all the time, especially when you're out there having a good time. Or maybe you went to Rapid City and you're close to the hills. That's our original home, where our spirit comes from. So you need to always call, because it's going to want to stay there. Bring your spirit with you. We have a high rate of suicide today, our young people. And I really believe it's because they're not connected to their spirit. And so if anything you take away from today, call your spirit four times, all the time. And we were taught that growing up. Our grandpa, Sam Kills Crow Indian, was our main teacher, and that's what he taught. Hakoja, toka heya wo chekye, ha wo takuye. Always remember, prayer comes first, and then how you're related to people. Those relationships are important. And then calling your spirit, Nahi Pichopi. We even had a program here a few years ago called Nahi Pichopi, called the spirit. I've worked on our reservation here since 1990. And a lot of the work that I did consisted of bringing the spirit of those young people home. And the one young lady I worked with was from Kyle. And her mother brought her to me. And in the lodge, I asked her, where was the last place that you remember really having a good time? And you were happy. She said, California. So her spirit was in California. 
So we had to call her spirit back. She called her spirit back. And any one of you is capable of that. What we did here this morning, or this afternoon, before class started for Marcel, you are all capable of doing that. That's part of who you are. Especially the women, your encouragement and support. And the men. You know, we talk, he won. Marcel said, family, okay. Are people dependent on symbols? Symbolism in their artwork, in their decor, how they dressed, all those symbols meant something to that family. Just like the symbol of a teepee, or even the turtle that I'm wearing today. You know, these are all symbolic of something. And so, to begin with, we'll start with family, tiwahe. This tiwahe was part of a wichoti, right? Wichoti is a bunch of tiwahes that live together. And tiwahe family is tiwahe, and that's made up of a mother, a father, children, and grandparents, and all the aunts and uncles. So in that home that we originally lived in, that symbol, that's a symbol of family, the tipi. And the uh, tishui bata is the name for the poles. Those represented the women, the backbone of our Lakota nation. And that backbone, there was a song made for her, and Sissy Goodhouse sings that, and so does one of the mushkes from uh, Porcupine. But she, they all sing it different. Uh, but there's four, to every verse of that song, a woman is reminded to be, to take courage, to be encouraged, because a nation comes from her. A generation comes from her, and a nation depends on her. So to be, to take courage. The second one says, be alert of mind because a generation comes from you and a nation depends on you. The third one, be alert of spirit because a generation comes from you and a nation depends on you. And the last verse, be strong hearted because a generation comes from you and a nation depends on you. So those are the words of that song and it's, it's a good song. But when you go through, the men have their manhood ceremony, the women have their womanhood ceremony. So we'll get to that, but in that home, that's the woman, the woman's song. So that's that first song, first verse. Then the other words that I told you come after that. That's the woman's song. So that's the poles, the main poles. And that main pole, the main poles here are the women. And those women walk with four medicines. And they're taught about these medicines during um, their lifetime, growing up and especially when they go through womanhood. Those grandmas and those aunties and those moms will come together and instruct her. And that first medicine that she is, uh, because she goes through her first moon, she's able to be fruitful. And so she's <coughs> taught those teachings about childbearing, so being fruitful. But, you know, for us in our ceremony, that choke cherry tree is really an important symbol for us, not only symbolically, but there's things that we use from that cherry tree during our womanhood to scratch. We can't touch ourselves, so we use them as scratchers, and we also use them for prayer when we're off our moon. So we're instructed not to be around um, sacred sites, um, sweat lodges, ceremonies, medicine people, and even from people that are taking Indian medicine, we can't be near them. So we're taught protocols at that time. So that's the woman. And in faithfulness, we're taught that every day we walk with a prayer. 
And those four sacred times of the day, daytime belongs to the man, nighttime belongs to us. And so blue is an important color for us. So being faithful to Creator God with that prayer, we walk with every day, but also being faithful to ourselves and in those lessons we were taught during womanhood about taking good care of ourselves, about honoring who we are as women now, about having respect for ourselves, and making sure that we learn those skills that those grandmas and aunties taught us well, whether it was quill work, whether it was bead work, or quilting, or whatever skill those women brought. And just like birthing, the woman that receives baby when baby is born, she wipes their mouth clean, she transfers her character. And that special person has to have some really good qualities in order to do that. Just like womanhood, we only pick those women that have good qualities because that these young women are in their sacred time and they're going to absorb the energy that's there, just like that baby. And so we have to take consideration of who we want in there. And I think back in the 90s, we did a transfer of character ceremony for two babies. They were twins. And um, they, they were three months old, but they came home. The people they wanted to do the transfer of character lived in California. And so in three months, they made it back. And that's when we did that transfer of character for that mom and her babies there. They're probably in this class, who knows? <laughs> or in one of the classes, but that's how long ago that was. So those birthing ceremonies were real important. They also taught you that because it's a way of helping you understand your role whenever, but it's not time. They also instruct you, you have to prepare yourself so that womanhood is just one part. Four years down the line, you're gonna do your throwing of the ball. And that means now you're able for courtship, for marriage, you know. And today, courtship doesn't happen like it used to. And in my generation, everybody had to go see my mom and dad before they could talk to me. It doesn't happen like that today. You can get on the internet instant. I hear some people getting married because they met somebody on the internet. I was like, wow. <laughs> so who approves them on the internet? Oh, you know, that's what the courtship was about because they had to approve. And I know that, um, I know it's probably different from my mom's generation, but she said, whoever comes you're going to marry has to have a home, he has to have a job, he has to have a car. Right? They also said he needs to be as smart as you are or smarter. I don't think anybody tells their children that today. And usually they picked who you were going to marry because they looked out for your compatibility and they looked at how they were going to strengthen their family too. But today, that has really changed. So we're, we're not that original courtship. Has that. I only witnessed one nephew that took his flute and he took it up to Amunichu um, Kojo and courted a young woman up there. He's passed on since, but I only witnessed one young man and if that would have happened in my generation, I would have married a Lakota. But it didn't. I married out. Because the one that came courtship, came courting, had a car, a home, and a job. <laughs> Just exactly what my mom said. Uh, probably maybe a little smarter than me. But the criteria she put out was he had to be tall. He didn't meet that one. Short like me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but that's okay. That's just one. But at least the rest of it. And then from there, also my great grandmothers and my grandfather, their son, all their teachings. Haboja, when Lakotas marry, they marry for life. That was the belief system of those grandpas and grandmas. And so, you know, my grandpa stayed married to my grandma until she passed on. But then he didn't take on another wife either. Tashno, you know, he, he stayed by himself. So there's a lot of teachings that he taught me. And I remember when I was pregnant with my first daughter, I adopted my oldest daughter, then my second daughter was pregnant with him. Um, I was really melancholy and I was crying. So he came in and he talked to me and he said, Takoja Cheya He said, Don't be crying. 
Krishna is Archina Vinikta, he said. Maybe Thakurja is going to think that you don't want her and she's going to go home. And so he taught us that words were sacred. We You have to remember our people originally were a very, very spiritual people. Everything that they did was male and female. Remember, grandfather and grandmother. <coughs> and so everything they did was in balance. And it was only this balance changed when they signed that treaty and then white men put us on this reservation and kind of took over and oppressed us and made their rules. We still live under their rules. We're still under the rules of the United States government even though we claim to be sovereign. And so that changed. That's why we have a high rate of domestic violence today. Because Washington said the man is up here, he's the boss. And he owned the woman and he owned the children and he owned the home. That's why today we all have to take our husband's name because of that. But in Lakota culture, man and woman were equal. The common people, we were all equal. Our role as women, and my grandfather reiterated that to me throughout my life. I have a shawl today, because he also said as women, we have shawls and we have to take our shawls with us. Shinaglomi, all the time. So, you know, I don't do it all the time, but if I'm going to talk to you about our culture, then I have to bring my shina. Okay? Important part of who we are as women. Okay? And so, as, as you know, the grandfather's teachings went on, you know, he, he raised um, me and my first cousin. We're, we grew up like brother and sister. And uh, his name was Larry. But he passed on since. And, um, I remember one time I went to a class, a master's level class, and our instructor um, happened to be, um, he's a well-known lawyer, but that his father helped with that initial welfare thing, but he said, you know how those high hawks are? How they like to party? And I was stunned. I was like, hey, those are my relatives. But I think you have to understand all of us and our trauma and what happened to us throughout the generations. And I look back at High Hawk, and that became Kills Crow Indian. Grandpa bought the name Kills Crow Indian because it was originally High Hawk. High Hawk was the brother to Spotted Out. They both died at Wounded Knee, all their families, except for one son who married my great grandmother, Rosie, Rosie High Hawk. She took on his name. They're all from Minikoju. So we're part Minikoju, but because of what happened to Grandpa's people, our one remaining great-grandfather was awarded some land here who married our grandma. Her name was Owl Bull. So our um, matriarchs were those two grandmothers, Rose High Hawk and Mabel Hawkins. They were sisters. And they were first cousins to Chief American Horse. Their mothers were sisters. And so all that information was passed on to us about our behavior, how we had to be amongst the people, how we had to listen, and how, as the oldest child, I have all my brothers and sisters following me. And I had to model that behavior. And so always, Grandpa always said, Iyushkiya, Oyate kiya. Always shake hands with your people or give them a hug because you don't know if that's the last time that you're going to see them. And our men, the women held their men in high esteem. And everything they did, and it wasn't because he's up here and he's the boss, no. They were at risk of being killed because they went to war all the time. And so, or they went on hunting parties and some of them didn't make it back. And so, of course, you know, the women had to hold their male relatives in high esteem. And even the protocols, how you're related to people. Like Grandpa said, So I have to say, this is Shichet. 
you know. I have to say, this is my brother-in-law. And maybe that's Takoja. And they're male, so what's my behavior towards them? And this is, this would be probably, I don't know how the relationship, who's Sam's parents? Um, did you play hook? Uh, no, did you close Indian? Okay. Okay, so you would be, yeah, all right, so you would be like my daughter-in-law. Mitchell's my, uh, yeah, well, my first cousin. Uh, Virginia and Helen and Rose, those are, those are uh, where he comes from. But his mom must be from Oglala, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that side of the family is who? Uh, good boys. Good boys out. Good boys out, okay. Yeah, I'm also related to you through your, the mom side on that one because she used to be married to my uncle Ambrose Ironrope. And so there's a, they have a sister in Grand Island, Nebraska. That's from there. That's yep. my mom, the, the mother too. The, anyway, so so somehow you're gonna find out you're related to a lot of people. <laughs> Once you know, like you said, family tree, you have to know who you're related to. And today we have a lot of intermarriages, not just out of the tribe, but intertribally. But we're also having them in the tribe. And that's not happening. And so that's why it was important for those grandmas and grandpas to tell us, know who you're related to. I remember going to Kyle to their powwow, took my sister and my niece with me, and we met my auntie. She's still alive. We went to visit her. And she told her grandson, look at her. Well, that's your relative. My niece was really embarrassed. But that's how it is. You have to know who you're related to. So don't be making eyes at each other, right? <laughs> they always say, you're going to get married? Go get married over the hill. Don't marry anybody here because we're related to everybody, right? And that's how it, is. it was for me. Gee, who are you with? No, nope, can't see him. You're related. Oh, my God. Gee, I'm related to everybody. So I married out. And then she said, I think you're related to him. I said, oh, to all that. He's a Mexican. How can we be related to Mexicans? <laughs> but yeah, you know, he had uh, he was with one of my aunts, my husband's older brother. They didn't have children, so you know, he went on and married someone else, and they had children. But you know, there's no relationship there. But she thought he was uh, uh, one of my aunties married that his older brother, and they had a son, and so she thought that's who that was. Oh, that's that of it. But anyway, so, you know, we even have those, right? So we have Miss Bravo here, <laughs> married out too, and some of you said you're Hudspit, right? To your grandma's Mexican. So there's a lot of, you know, and same with my children. You know, my children are half Indian and half Mexican, and I always tell them, be proud of who you are. You're both. So be proud. Never be ashamed of who you are. But today, you know, who taught us about um, exclusiveness? Oh, you can, you can only be this much. No, you can't be part of the tribe because you only got this one. Who taught us all that? Our people were about inclusion, inclusive. That's why we have hunka ceremonies. We never excluded people. But today, we <coughs> live that way. But we're all the same people, and we have to remember that. And when we can think as one and work as one, we're going to be powerful, powerful people. Can you imagine? So the woman are the poles, the covering are the men, because they're there to provide and protect. And there were ceremonies throughout the time they made their journey here. When that little spirit came from the spirit world, he entered in the southeast direction, that door to the spirit world, and came into this world. I'll meet his parents. And so, in Washington culture and, and the influence of Christianity, they teach us that there's only one sacred child, and that's the Christ child. And that's where all the confusion begins about who we are. Because we were taught by them 
that our ways were bad. We couldn't speak our language at the Catholic boarding school that I went to. Oh, we dared not tell we were at a ceremony that weekend when we went home, because we would get in trouble, and our parents would get in trouble. All of those of who, about who we are was outlawed on this reservation. Probably in the late 50s, some of them got together, some of those elders that have passed on now, and said, can we have our sun dance? And so that first sun dance was over here by where the red clouds lived. And now all of us came to that one sun dance. All of us, regardless of where we were in the country, that's where we came home to for that sun dance. During the day, it was a sun dance. At night, it was a powwow. And there was a carnival going all day. <laughs> so everybody got enjoyment. That was our little break from the Washichu world. But then, 1978, the Freedom of Religion Act, that's when we could openly worship our spirits, practice our spirituality, have our sweat lodges, our sun dances. We're the only tribe that still has its seven ceremonies. And we have helped other tribes. So sweat lodges, sun dances are all over. They're even in Germany, they're in Israel, Italy, Mexico, you know. But a lot of, like the Mexican Indians, they were, the sun, they were sun worshipers too. And the sacrament that they used was before Christ, 200 years before Christ. And it's still here. And that sacrament moved up north. And it came here to our reservation from the Winnebago's. And the grandpas then, Hills Crow Indian, um, Black Bear, Blue Bird, just to name a few, in Allen, started that church, Native American church. And they used the sacrament of Peel. Quanta Parker, who was a Comanche chief, brought that this way. They started it in Oklahoma because they wanted to worship the way their, pe their people did. Every tribe has the way you worship, and so that church allows that. But Grandpa, because he was sent to Genoa, Nebraska, to boarding school, he was Christianized, and his name was changed to Stevenson. And he came back toting a Bible. But something happened to Grandpa, him and Grandma Mabel Hawkins, because those two went Native American church, and I have pictures of them sitting in a ceremony together. But, um, and that's how we buried Grandma Hawkins in Porcupine. Native American church. It was a big, I've never seen a camp that big. Everybody set up their teepees and tents and we camped out for, for about six, seven days there. But in the old days when somebody died, they all came like that. And they all stayed, some of them, for up to a year to help the family recover. And I used to ask my aunt, and that's Mitchell's grandma, Julie. I'd say, Auntie, Tell me about the old times. And she would always say, She'd say, no, I don't know anything. But you know, when her husband died, my uncle, my ate, there was nothing left in her home. Nothing. Not even a bed to lay in. Not even anything to cook with. And this is a woman who didn't know nothing. So our people, aren't like this, it's action. They do things. And when I was growing up, I got confused by Washichu worldview. And I used to think, gee, them Washichu kids, they, their moms tell them I love you, or their dads, how come they don't tell me that? Well, of course not, they're Lakotas, they don't speak English. Right? But, so how come they don't say, I love you? <laughs> so then I understood because they, they didn't say it, they showed it. They showed it by the honorings, the birthday parties, all those things. So I, I learned how birthday parties happen in Washichu culture, but trying to help my own children about who they are as Lakota people, 
I said, you know, babe, what she do is when they have a birthday party, everybody brings presents. But you're not going to do that. Who you invite to your party, you're going to give a present. You're going to give. And then same thing with my grandchildren. Your Lakotas, how are we going to keep that generosity going? All right, Takojas, we're going to go store. $15 a piece, pick a present for yourself. Three little boys. Oh, they were so happy. Wrap it up real nice, remember? Okay. I said, all right. There's a mom that went to treatment over there. We're renting her the house now. Three little boys. And you're going to give them the presents that you bought for yourself. Oh, you should have seen their faces fall. We have to give them away. I said, yes. But I said, your present is, I want you to watch the face of that little boy when he gets your present. That's your present, your gift. And they took their presents. And you should have seen the kids that got the gifts because their mom was in treatment. They didn't have anything. And they were so happy, those little boys. Thank you, thank you. And they gave them hugs. And my grandsons just glowed. And I said, now you see what I mean, grandson. He said, yeah. Same thing with my daughters. They had to go out and uh, before Christmas, they would go and um, house to house and, and get money or toys or whatever they could to host a, a Christmas party for their little relatives, the Lakotas in our community. So that generosity piece is our way, our own way to create that opportunity for ourselves and our relatives so that we keep our Lakota way. And that's the same with our education. I have a good friend, her name is Shirley, and she was a, worked for the federal government for many years. She's actually from the Red Cloud family, and she was taught by her side of the family, you know, always look out for your people. And that's what she did, and that's what you guys need to do. How do you take care of your people? You have to be alert of mind, alert of spirit. How am I going to do this to help my people? We never lived individually. We always lived in a group and always looked out. So even our child rearing, how we raise our children was done by the whole group. So, you know, a mom wasn't burdened by taking care of, today it's like that. Mothers have a hard time because no one's there helping them. But in the old days, it wasn't like that. Even when I was growing up, oh man, we looked forward to fall when everybody had to work and the babysitter had to come and take care of us. And they didn't get paid. They had a place to live, they had food to eat, and they were part of the family, so they had to take care of the children. That was their role. Today we have homes and nobody has a role. Everybody's confused. Everybody's mad at each other. Because who's going to pay the bills? Who's going to buy the food? We don't know how to share. We don't know what generosity is today. And so there's a refrigerator, there's three families, the tops, this family, the ones, this family, and the ones, this family. <laughs> but it's the system that made us that way, right? EBT, you can't share your food. And so in my days it was called food stamps. And um, I, don't, I think I was on them for three months. But, um, and welfare, but we had to pay it back once. The settlement for my husband came through, we paid them back. But every once in a while, you know, it's there, but it's not there like it used to be either. Our young people are really having hardships. And so that male role to provide and protect, that's really, um, uh, I guess we need to strengthen that. And even the female role, because we have a lot of mothers that are abandoning their children. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of fathers that are abandoning the mother and the child. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to, and, and we're a whole, you're a whole new generation. So what can we do? So 1992, the honoring of the spirit in the womb ceremony. To welcome the spirit of that baby. And Philomene, she's around here somewhere, teaching or taking classes. Um, she taught me that ceremony. And I've been doing it since in addition to all the birthing ceremonies. The placenta, the transfer of character, the welcoming, the prophesying, the umbilical cord teachings. This turtle is what the belly button goes in for the little girl. 
spirit of the turtle protects it. And that story you told us about um, Kea Zuya Ia, that, mm -hmm. that's about the strength of that turtle and how much they tried to kill him, but they couldn't. And so that's, and then there's a lot of teachings. You turn that upside down, and there's a lot of teachings on, on, on that turtle. And so hopefully someday they report Phyllis Swift talk because she has all that knowledge. And she's part of the um, college system. So you have many wonderful teachers in every community. And some, maybe they don't even come to college, you need to go find them in your communities. Take them some tobacco, take them some food, and spend some time learning. So the ceremonies, you know, they said these were powerful. And these were sacred. Everything was sacred about our people. Like I said, Christ was the only sacred child in a white culture. In our culture, you're all, all of you were sacred children. You're still sacred. We walk humbly because of that spirit. Did you guys know that? You guys know you have a spirit? Yeah? No? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. Did you know that your spirit talks to you sometimes? Mm -hmm. It does. It does. But some of us don't know how to listen. I know that um, when, when I eat something I'm not supposed to eat, my body tells me, I start sneezing. I say, oh no, I shouldn't have ate that. You know, so it talks to us, but we don't listen. And today, too, some of you, how many of you really hear? Do you hear voices? Do you see things? Do you see spirit? Mm -hmm. some, some of our young people do. But because they're raised away without the language or even from here, and even those that are here, um, if you don't understand, and you're going to say, oh, my little grandson that did that, he's 12. There's a demon in me. I spend time with him. Grandson, do they talk to you? Yeah, grandma, they talk to me. What do they sound like? I said, do they sound like that? Yeah, they sound like, I said, they're speaking Lakota to you, Trapojav. But you don't understand. But we can go. And I said, it, there's no demon in you. It's spirits. You're 12 now. It's time. So they're talking to you. But see, we don't understand our own mental health. So you go and tell a counselor, or maybe you, you go to mental health, and they're going to say, Gee, how long have you been hearing these voices and seeing these things? Pretty soon they got you labeled schizophrenic, got you on pills, and send you, you off to Yankton for another evaluation. And they did that to our people. When they first put us on the reservation, those Lakota people that couldn't speak English, they put them in Canton, South Dakota, some mental health place, just because they couldn't speak English. So that's some of the trauma that happened to our people that we carry today. So if you're going to be a social worker, if you're going to be a counselor, <clears throat> you have to be, make sure you know how to think. Make sure you go to a medicine man. Make sure you get some guidance, get some help. And if you're, your children, your girls, they're young women, take them to older women that are going to help them and go with them to the spiritual leaders. Because of all the history of the bad things that happened to us as a people, we have to be overprotective today. And the woman society that my sister Rita and I started, and now she's passed, I still carry it forward. It's called, it got renamed Stone Boy from uh, my cousin Richard Moose Camp's altar. Stone Boy Women's Society. Birthing ceremonies and womanhood ceremonies. Still carrying on the work. So it's important, you know, so that man to provide and protect, he's the covering around that teepee. And that home belongs to the woman. She owns that home. Because even though he provided the skins for it, she's the one that had to prepare them, sew them, and make her home. And clothe her children. Put shoes on their feet, her, the moccasins. 
And so as this young woman grows up, she has to learn all that. And that's what's going to determine who she's going to marry. Because who's going to provide all of that for her so she can have that home? Right? And so it's equal job there between the man and the woman. Right? So today, we don't have those clear expectations of each other in relationships. And so in the old days, they knew. They knew, and like my Uncle James used to say, you know, me and mom, we know, but you young people, you talk to each other, but you still don't know. And he said, we don't talk to each other, but we know what we have to do for each other. And so that, you know, those teachings really um, helps you to understand there's a way that a man and woman honor each other. And every month, my mom did that with my dad. And this wase, they use that. And wasna, sacred food. And in the privacy of their room, they honored each other. And then when she was done, she'd come out, share that with her children. And so prayer was the foundation of that home. It was about our belief system. It was family-centered, because it included all the family. Okay? And it was about working together. What should you work for? It's collaboration. Working together. And it was about empowerment. And it was always inclusive. It included everybody in that Uchoti, in that Tiwahe. And so those ceremonies, childhood ceremonies, everybody in that Uchoti witnessed those ceremonies. From the time that baby was born all the way to manhood, womanhood, and marriage. Okay. That marriage piece, I really listened to my grandpa, Papa. Papa lived with me until um, I, my, uh, my daughter wasn't born yet when he passed on. My daughter was born in December and he passed on that, that fall, probably around October, November, around that time. But he knew, he knew that my daughter was a girl. And he reminded me about prophecy. You know, he said, your prophecy, remember your grandma's prophecy for you. And in 1992, the prophecy came true because my voice was heard at once by all my relatives. And 23 years later, it still happened. Because I'm on Keeley Radio every Monday, 9 to 10, talking to the people about who we are, our way of life, our language, our world view, our thinking patterns, our customary behaviors, how we raised our children, how we buried our children, those ceremonies that were important to celebrate the growth and development of that child as it met its milestones. Just like um, the relatives, my sister-in-law, she's Navajo, they have whoever makes that baby laugh has to put on a feast. We had ceremonies like that too. When baby first walked, throw your star blanket out, crawl, walk. So we had those celebrations. Today it's transferred to birthdays, but those others were there, and that's what's important about knowing who you are, so you can celebrate them. But one thing we still do is the naming ceremony, right? I heard uh, one of my relatives, uh, um, when their baby was born, uh, they lived up in the mountains, I guess. But mm. what they did was they put the baby up outside, or not, I don't know how they did this, but they got snow and they got la 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 on Oh. Because <laughs> that's one of their customs. Mm -hmm. I don't know what tribe that was. But, uh, and, um, <clears throat> really the Ute. Yeah. Really, that's in the really, mountains. Really uh, scary for the baby, but but then again, the, the mother was encouraged to breastfeed. Mm -hmm. And so it, it made the baby real strong. So today, if you, when, when a baby's just able to walk, when you hold a baby, he's standing right here, he stand, they stand by themselves, have to walk in. It's a mm -hmm. real strong baby. So, I mean, that was kind of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what he's saying is true, because 
When you're a breastfed baby, the breast milk has something special in it that nothing, no other milk has that helps that baby's growth and development. And especially in the brain area, the neurons, the, the, the whole system of the brain um, connects together faster and better because of that breast milk. So it's real important that mothers breastfeed their babies. At least, you know, tell, you know, well, the old days, those moms breastfed for a long time because they didn't have one baby right after the other like today. They waited. And so I even heard of, um, well, my husband breastfed till he was five. <laughs> I breastfed till I was six. Yeah, and I have an uh, uncle who was breastfed till he was nine. <laughs> <laughs> so those must have really been healthy children. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, I was breastfed too, but I don't remember how old I was when she quit breastfeeding. But, yeah, so it's really important, and I also breastfed my daughter. And so those are important parts of who we are. And, you know, and it's, breastfeeding is natural and it's nice. You don't have to go boil bottles in the middle of the night, half asleep, trying to make milk, you know. <laughs> it's easy and simple, you know. Go back to the simple way of life. And that's what our children need today. Not all this technology that's, you know, even it's not healthy. I know somebody got after me because I had this and my phone here. So I don't want to say nothing to you, but they say that causes cancer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, those, um, you have to look at the new and the old and find balance. That's what it's about today. And, and the balance part of it, as we talk about the men folk and, and their their thing. They know how to balance things. They're going to, you know, if anything gets overwhelming, they're going to go wipe themselves down in a sweat lodge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's uh, 2.20. I think we should take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back, and then we'll Okay. Continue. Sounds like a good so. place. Yeah. Okay, well, we were talking about the male and female roles. And I think in, in our culture, we have our Lakota language, uh, we have our worldview, and remember that our worldview is rooted in the mysticism of our supernatural world, and also in the intuitiveness of how we think. And so intuition is something that kind of got educated away, but it's still there in all of us. We know when something's gonna happen before it happens. Uh, we can feel things, right? That's part of your intuition. And that's how our people, that's the worldview. And Washichu culture, it's about skepticism, and it's about logic. But ours is mysticism and intuitiveness. So big difference between the worldviews. And then after the worldview or how people think, their mental health, then it's the customary behaviors. And that's what we're talking about, the male and female roles and childbearing and child rearing. And so when we talk about customary behaviors, we're also not just talking about male and female and childbearing and child rearing practices, how our people raise their children, but also we're talking about the helping behaviors, the problem solving. We don't have a six step method of problem solving, but we have peacekeeping and peacemaking. Remember, sacred woman brought that Chinupa to our people about 19 generations ago. And it's only been in the last two generations that that pipe has been taken care of by men. Before that, it was all women. So things have changed a little in our worldview too. But for a lot of us, to me, the pipe keeper is like the Pope what the Pope is to the Catholics. That's what the pipe keeper is to me. And so, to many of us. And so, when we have our womanhood, before we go through all that, we take our girls up there to have a conversation with the pipe keeper and pay respects, homage to the sacred pipe and bring their, their ties and their flags and their offerings. So that's how important that is. That's like our little pilgrimage every year and to give advice, get advice and direction for all of us. So, <clears throat> um, problem solving, helping behaviors, 
<clears throat> etiquette again etiquette for us is that please thank you all that stuff like white people etiquette is about how you're related to people and those I guess respect responsibility that goes with that relationship there's an obligation and responsibility to that relative and so if that relatives are older than you or even your age or you know and if they're younger than then you're the older one, so you have to model that. And if they're older than you, then they're modeling for you, so you really have to pay attention. So uh, those are the customary behaviors, and of course, the <clears throat> those behaviors determine the values that we have today, living those laws of life, the values of our people. Hokshi chanki yapi, ihaki chiktapi, waktaki chapi, okichi holapi. You know, having trust in each other. And that's really sad today because we all got to lock our car doors or our homes because we don't have that trust. You know, but that trust belongs here with you first. Do you trust yourself when it goes out there? Because if you don't have it, how can you expect? You don't have, you can't give what you don't have. Let's just put it that way. And so, <clears throat> those are the lifetime values. And I think they gave you a copy. Do, did you ever give one to your class? Mm -hmm. Oh, did you guys get the Makawi Choni Tawoke? Living the Laws of Life. It's a TP from the in the womb all the way to elderhood. Okay, well, he'll get you a copy because I gave him a copy in your class. If not, I don't think I brought any with you, but <coughs> next time. Well, that's you have some somewhere, okay. I think um, that one was a gift from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. I did a site visit back in um, 2009. They got a children's mental health project, so I did a site visit, and that was one of the resources that they produced for their tribe. But those are all the values that we have as a of people. So anyway, he'll, he'll share that. There are more so those those uh, are the the values that determine the customary behaviors of our people. So if anybody ever asks you, what are the customary behaviors? That's the male and female role. That's how we raise our children. This is how we solve problems. You know, because we're the original peacemakers, peacekeepers. Makota, you just say, go wash them. Make it right with you. And today our judicial system is based on Washichu worldview, so there's always losers and winners. But in our old way of peacekeeping and peacemaking, you know, there was everybody was a winner. And they all came out relatives. And every community in the old days when they lived in the old camps, the Wakichoza um, no, the shirt wearers were the ones that kept peace. And so if there was conflict in the family, those shirt wearers would go and make peace help the people come to peace with each other. But as that was taken away, then we had medicine people. And in the community that I taught um, or worked in for four years, they had four peacekeepers. I think it was three medicine men and, oh no, two medicine men, one medicine woman, and a community member, an elder. And they were the ones that went to the homes and talked with the family and kept peace. Now, today there's very few people that do it, but they still do it. I witnessed it. Um, one of the grandma's grandson was married in a family. Um, him and his girlfriend broke up, and they had children. They broke up. And so, I don't know what the issue was, but I know the grandma went home and packed her trunk full of gifts, star blankets, penaltons, and whatever else she could fit in that trunk. And she went to that trunk, and her grandson back to the family and gave them, gave them that stuff to bring peace. And they, they took the grandson back. But I don't know the details of the intimate stuff, but you know, I know people can still do that. You know, and I know that when I was working at public safety, I was asked by one of my male relatives to talk to the daughters in the family and their mothers. And so again, that's another way of making peace. And we sat in a circle and we talked. 
but they all got to talk to each other. And that's what the brother wanted, you know, because the girls were teenagers and they uh, must have acted out something that the, and in our, in our families, the, the first cousins are all brothers and sisters, and even not just first cousins, all the way down from our great grandmother's lineage, we're all brothers and sisters, and we address each other like that. Mikhangala, Chue, Misunghala, Tiblo, for us as women. And of course, the men, they're going to say older brother, they'll say Chue. That's Tiblo to us. And so we address each other that way. And so having to go in that family, and, and I remember um, the father of the family told me, and this was the grandfather of the girls, he told me, he said, you know, my daughter, you're home now. You never have to knock at that door because this is your home. And, and so always went in, didn't have to knock. But that, that was home because we come from the two grandmothers. And then, um, but, you know, he, he instructed me. He didn't call me on the phone or talk to me like that. It was through here, telepathy. And I always ended up, he said, did you hear me calling? I said, yeah, I heard you, Dad. But he taught me a lot in the short time that I got to spend with him. But I spent a lot of time with him when I was a little girl. And he was like our Naja, like our leader, and our Tioshpai, because we traveled. We were migrants and traveled. Uh, right now, potatoes just got done being harvested. So now they're moving into the beets. And so working the farm, you know what the harvest season is. So in uh, late summer, we were hauling bales. Um, late August and September, we were picking potatoes. October started the uh, harvest for the beets. So you were out there cutting beets. Summertime, you were hoeing those. And that was the farm workers. And that's what we were as uh, our grandparents moved off the reservation and worked for the farmers. So we were third generation farm workers. So we knew how to stack hay, haul hay, name it. We contracted a lot of hay. That's, that was our way of life. And so um, my uncle was the nacha for our little Tioshpaya that traveled together like that. And so um, a lot of the teachings that, like, um, I travel a lot, a lot. Sometimes because I'm pouring water or I'm at a ceremony. We get out of ceremony at 3 o'clock in the morning. And if I'm in Shadron at a ceremony, then that means I have two hours to drive home to Martin. And so 3 o'clock in the morning, we're done, then I'm home by 5, right? Or if we're done at midnight, I'm home by 2 or 3. I was in Allen, and it was 12.30. And I have to travel to Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. So I, I got done with the sweat, and I started to leave, and my uh, uncle dad said, um, He said, where are you going, my daughter? I said, I'm going home now. Yeah, he said. Why uh, he said, that door is open, didn't you know that? I said, what are you talking about? He said, that door to the spirit world is open at 2 o'clock in the morning. And it don't matter how good you are, if you're out there, they're going to take you. <coughs> Stunned. I was like, well, I'm always out there because I'm running sweats <laughs> at a ceremony. What can I do? He said, take protection with you. Always have your sage, your sweet grass, your cedar, or your plume, or your feathers with you to protect you. So always do that. Always have my sage with me. You never know. I have tobacco too. So those those were safety measures that he taught me, and I never I never knew that. Nobody ever told me that. How many of you know that? Okay. Two o'clock in the morning. It's open. So when I go to the casino. I always tell them, hey, that door is going to be open pretty soon. You better head home. <laughs> Not unless you have sage. You need some sage. I got some. <laughs> yeah, so to protect your people. So those are, are, are the four things. Any culture, there's going to be always language, worldview, customary behaviors, and values. Those values are real important. That's what helped us survive this far because those great grandfathers remembered. And so uh, in 1992, Chief Oliver Red Cloud came to, and some other elders came to Healthy Start. We had a gathering of elders, and we wanted to know if we had a tribal history of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. 
lot of infant mortality, high rates. We had a lot of babies dying. And um, we had a wiping their tears ceremony for, for the parents, the mothers and fathers of those babies. And I was instructed by my advisory. And my advisory at that time, um, our spiritual leader was Wilmer, Wilmer Mestez, who's passed on since. Um, so we really suffered a loss this year with you know, his death. And, uh, but you know, he taught all of us something. So hopefully you carry that forward, that message that he had for all of us to honor his memory. And always remember when you see his children to give them a hug or shake their hand and give them some encouragement like we did for Marcel here or others of your relatives that are suffering like that. Okay. And like I told our Lakota Language 3 class, you know, I do these things but every one of you are capable of doing them too. You know, sometimes we think, oh, I can't do that because uh, I'm not a medicine man or I'm not a medicine woman. No, those are inherent rights that we have as Lakota people. And you should be doing those things for yourself too. In the morning, aziria yourself, smudge yourself, pray. Ask for that sun's energy so that you can make it throughout that day, this day. And then when nighttime comes, when you're done with your work, whether it's school work or work, to give that Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving isn't in November. It's every day of our life. We give that wopila. And so this whole day is actually a ceremony for you. And even when you have your lunch, that's another sacred time of the day. And so you stop. And yeah, the Catholics taught us to do a noon prayer for our meal, but you know, as Lakota people, we, we do that anyway, and we feed the spirits. How many of you feed the spirits? You need to, and the reason for that is because we never want to starve. And those spirits, when we take good care of them, they're going to take good care of us. And who knows how many spirits are there? The circle that I'm a part of, 668 spirits. And I could probably name 50 of them, that's all. And our spiritual leader, our medicine man, someday he'll be able to name all 668. Can you imagine? That's powerful. That's powerful. So you need to know about ceremony. There's some protocols that go with that too. You know, and that's another class. <laughs> so the sacredness of who we are is really important and we need to carry that forward for our children. So when our babies are born, the lessons of the cradle board, that cradle board, I'll share a story about one of the aunties went to Rosebud IHS with her niece. And her, a mom came in with one of those little things that carry the babies and put the handle, came in and set it down. And so the grandmas told her niece, I said, she said, uh, to ask mom if she'll let me hold the baby. So she brought the baby to the Uchi, and Uchi was really rocking baby and talking to her. Oh, you know, she was talking to the baby, telling the baby that it came to a difficult time because baby was going to have a crooked back. And so the baby started crying. And she explained to the baby that it was going to have a crooked back because of that carrier that that mom had it in. And it's like this. And so baby started crying. And so the umchila told the niece, The baby was crying. Have you guys heard babies that say that? When they cry? When they first born, that's what they say. Ina, Ina, if you ever listen, when you have your baby, listen, see if it says Ina. What does Ina mean? Mom. mom, exactly, mom. So baby started crying for mom. So Ina, Ina, It's crying for Ina, so it took the baby back. Ina took baby and put it back into that chair, that carrier, and then stuck a bottle in its mouth and propped it up with blankets. 
until you locked up. She a hand and a lakotia piki a kahni rapshnu. She said they don't understand lakota because the baby's crying for mom. But she put a bottle in its mouth and put it back in that thing. So her and another grandma that's uh, 95 now, she's still alive. They said that hokshikigna eapikile they said we forgot how to nurture our babies. Nobody sings to the babies no more. No lullabies. I grew up with Abu Bebe Shah. How many of you heard that song? Or Amu? Anybody? Yeah? I think that that song, you know, is universal to all of us that grew up in the Lakota language. Someone will say Amu, but you know, either way. So every one of us that comes from a family, we have a version of that song. Or I remember growing up as a little girl and kind of try to have a temper tantrum, they sing a little song. The little rabbit got mad and kicked its tail off. <laughs> so, uh, temper tantrums, we all probably tried to have them. I tried. I tried. I did. I tried. I saw my little cousin go in a big department store in Denver, Colorado and had a temper tantrum because he wanted this toy. <laughs> and the parents were so embarrassed, they bought the toy and he didn't cry and they walked out. I said, oh, I want that doll too. It was only like four years old. I did it. Uh, I threw myself on the ground and I cried and I kicked like he did. And uh, I looked up and here there was nobody there. Don't keep up. <laughs> I got scared. I jumped up and went to look for them. They were nowhere in the store. They were gone. I was like, oh my God, I panicked. I ran outside and I didn't see them. You know, it's a big town, Denver, big department store. And I started, I was going to cry and I started to get scared and then they peeked around the corner. It's my, my two aunties and my big mom. They peeked up. Oh, it's Jelly Nia. Are you all right now? <laughs> <laughs> but that's called shunning. You know, you don't want it like that behavior, then, you know, don't pay attention to it. And that's what they did. They didn't like how I acted, so they ran away from me. I didn't see them running, but <laughs> they weren't there. <laughs> and that's how that big mom raised me. She never spanked me. She never hollered at me. But if I misbehaved, she didn't pay attention to me. She didn't talk to me for a whole day. And if I, claim, uh, and if I complained to my dad, her husband, I said, Daddy, Mom's not talking to me. And they get into it, there goes another day. And so I really had to. And then my, um, my big mom raised me, her and her husband. So um, that's my mom's oldest sister. And so her husband was my dad too. And all he had to do when I was um, just thinking about going out, he had a drumstick. He'd go, hey, hey. I'd look and he'd go like this to the drumstick. And I knew that meant that my behavior was out of order. And my big mom, all she had to do was look at me. And I knew. And so you're taught already about your behavior and you're coached coaching we have a coach here that's in sports but coaching happens young you need to coach your children and that's what i did with my children we're going to go to a ceremony and you have to sit still throughout the odd whole night you probably even sleep where you're sitting but you need to go to the bathroom you need to get a drink of water and that's where you're going to sit and pray all night <coughs> only once i had to um, take my oldest daughter in the bathroom and give her a good talking to. But that was just one time. The rest, they know. So all, and before we go to the store, same thing. We're going to go to the store. This is how much money we have, and this is what I'm going to buy. So don't ask for anything. Otherwise, you're going to stay home. And sometimes we didn't make it to the store. They'd have to go home. Then I'd go to the store because they have to stay home with their dad. And so the sweet choti, our way of life always had rules. That teepee had rules. 
the foundation of it, the circle, mitakuye oyasin, all the things I talked about there. The poles, the rules, the structure, know the rules. Every family has wobche, laws, rules. Our tribe has laws. Our families have rules. Today we have a lot of families running without rules. Everyone, know those rules. It's going to organize your work and always tie back into this collaboration, working together, being family, right? All of the things we talked about in the circle, that's the spirit of that home. And it always is going to tie back into there. Then at the top, the top where those TB posts tie, those are the strategies. Those are the teaching skills you're going to use to help your family. So we talked about the mother, the father, the stakes that hold down that teepee and secure it. Those are the sacred children. And then the wipipaha, the smoke flaps, unchi and kaka, grandma and grandpa. Without the cultural and spiritual teachings, we wouldn't know who we were as Lakota people. So it's real important that they were a part of our family. Washichu culture, family is mom, dad, and the kids. Have you noticed that? In Lakota culture, it's all our relatives. Everyone has a purpose in that family. Everybody has a role. And they know. And growing up, if you stay amongst the people, amongst relatives, you're going to be helpful. You're not going to go live with them and lay around all day. You're going to be helpful. You're going to help clean. You're going to help cook. Nobody tells anybody that anymore. I went to do a home visit, and I had two of my grown cousins sitting there. and The house was a mess. The mom had two little kids. And I said, well, if you're living here, how come you're not helping? They got up right away, took brooms. But you know, sometimes you have to be blunt. We're people that help each other. We're people that cared for each other. We had concern and consideration. But today, we're not passing that on. We're not. My uh, my Shicheshi, um, Samus can't talk about that. He said, that man had a bunch of extra shoes, but he didn't want to you know, lend them out to his ones that didn't have no shoes. And then he talked about, our relatives hitchhiking on the road, but nobody picks them up, just pass them by. Was it like that in the old days? People helped each other. I try to pick up who I can and give them a ride. Sometimes they end up being my relatives. I had one cousin I picked up coming towards Gordon, and, and he said, oh, cousin, it's me, and I can't get in your car because you have your feather. And my feather was hanging from the um, mirror. So he said, I'm, 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 uh, he was high, he was drunk. He said, I'm, uh, out of respect, I'm, I'm not going to get in your car. That's all right, we'll catch the next ride, him and his girlfriend. His girlfriend's face just fell. <laughs> that was a decision he made. He said, out of respect. I said, oh, okay, cousin. All right. So some of our people still have that respect, you know. And some of us that aren't even, I guess, uh, in that kind of state, we still don't have that respect for those things, you know. So um, I'm always observing the leadership. There's staffs up there, Waho Kezas, those are sacred. And yet, you know, they, there's, there's a certain way we have to be around things, go around things and respect things. And sometimes those are disrespected too. So, you know, we have to be observant of ourselves and other people and learn from that. And I was here in at the school, OCS, and um, the grandmas wanted, the matrons wanted to learn how to be, um, uh, to be traditional, they said. So I came. There was about 10 of them. And one of them said, I want us to go back to the old way. <coughs> All right, good. So what do you mean by the old way? I want us to be able to spank our children again. <laughs> I said, that's not our old way. <laughs> Lakota people never, never, never hit their children. Never. That's something we learned in the boarding school because it happened to our grandparents. But because of the sacredness of that child, that child, they taught us there is a ceremony for these hands. These are sacred. 
for the man and woman. You never hit a child. You never hit a woman or another Lakota with his hands. You know, for the man, he has to provide and protect with those. For the women, we have to build our homes, nurture our children, cook for our children. So even the instructions with how, how to prepare ourselves. Iglu wiyan, Lakota word. It means to be prepared, iglu wiyan. But you know what it literally says? Iglu, to make, wiyan, to make a woman. So that's an honor to us because we were prepared in the old days. Take, out, take down our TP in less than five minutes, put it up in maybe the same, and be ready to go. And they, and they spaced their children four years apart. And they didn't have a whole bunch of kids. They couldn't afford to because we were nomadic. Can you imagine the enemy coming and you had a dozen children and they're all scattered all over? <laughs> Some of them wouldn't make it. Even the babies, they had to, you know, they had to not cry because the enemy <coughs> might be near, so they would, you know, hold their little noses like that so they could breathe. <coughs> to cry. That would probably be called child abuse today, but in the old days, you know, they would have gave away our camp and we would have all been killed. So there was precautions and protocols they took. And so our babies were in a cradle board. Not like the sticks, I should have brought my cradle board, not like that. We make them like that today, but um, they were just in leather and they had the strings attached. Those were our cradle boards. And those cradle boards really kept the baby's back straight. So they sat up straight. They were straight. No, what is it called? It os osio what is that called? Remember? Osteolosis or something like that where your back mm -hmm. is bad? Crooked? Scoliosis. 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 Yeah. Scoliosis. We didn't have, yeah, we didn't have any of that because of the way the babies were wrapped because of the way the babies were put in the cradle board. And they were always near the mom. There's stories about how, how Iktomi came to the camp and um, these two ladies who were not paying attention to their babies and, and just talking, 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 didn't even bother to check on their babies. And so he stole the babies and put sage in them to pretend they were still in the cradle board, but he had the babies. The other version I got from that, that was um, from a friend, uh, Phyllis, who talks about that story. But the version I got was that it was during choke cherry gathering time, and Iktomi came to the camp, and the women wanted to go gather choke cherries, because choke cherries are an important part of our ceremonies for us. But they couldn't go because they didn't have a babysitter. Here Iktomi came, he said, oh, I'll, I'll watch the kids. But they didn't know him. How, how you know? How can this guy suddenly appear? We're going to trust him? I don't think so. And he would tell him, well, you know, Iktomi had this real velvet voice that could talk people into things. So Atalana, he, he went and talked to him. He said, well, you're not going to I'm going to feed him, you know, and put him to bed. I'm going to take good care of him. But if you don't hurry, you know, the birds are going to get all the choke cherries and you won't have any choke cherries. So they thought about it. Don't worry, I'm a real good babysitter. I'll take good care of them. They said, all right, well, they took off. And it was about, it was getting towards dusk. They came home with all their choke cherries and their hair all over. They were tired and hungry. He met them at the camp entrance. Oh, wana yagli pelo, washte yelo. And then, oya manamha. Do you smell that? Wahapi chichanga pelo. He said, I made you soup. Oh, they were so happy because they were hungry. And they noticed the children weren't there. They said, O kanjak to kiabe. Hiya, I shall chichaka. We steam it with chalking to keep him. He said, Remember, I told you I was going to put him to sleep, so I did. Oh, okay. Oh, you took up in the water bowl. So after they sat down, and they started to eat the soup. Well, now they were just getting ready to eat. He became the camp crier. Hey, Oyate, here, Bo. What now? They're not mine, Chaka Bo. Hokshiglu tapelo. He told them, Come, come look at these women. They're eating their children. 
they made the children into soup. You know, I wanted to tell that during um, the month of April, month of the child, but my <laughs> child protection team members thought that was kind of too much. But you know what? It's not because it happened. It happened in real life. We have a little Lakota, his dad, his grandma was Lakota, his grandpa was Navajo. And their son, married, not married, but had a girlfriend that was Spala, Mexican. They had a little boy together. So part, part Mexican, part Navajo, and part Lakota. Then they broke up, and they really, they really loved their baby. Everything, everything was about their little baby. Even though they were separated and she had a boyfriend, they took good care of their baby. Well, somehow, this Mexican woman's boyfriend is from Mexico. And somehow he got real jealous about, about this little boy. Really jealous. And so, what he did, he butchered the little boy. Fed him to the dogs, part of him. Tried to flush some of it down. <coughs> And you know what, I, I think he got away with the technicality. I don't even think he's in prison. I think he's in Mexico. But that's reality. And young women, the same thing happened with our own people. Father was from here. Mother was from Rosebud. They broke up. Mother from Rosebud had a boyfriend from Rosebud. He killed the baby out of jealousy. And so those things are for real. And so we have to be careful. And, and even today, some of the older mothers that have grown children, they think the guy is after them. You know, mm -mm. he's after the children. That's reality today. And so we have to be careful. Ikdomi is here in many forms. <coughs> Not only is he with the children, but he's also with the grown-ups. That's why they tell the stories about Iktomi to teach us about what's right and wrong. There's a, even an Iktomi, a woman. And there's one about a man. The man fell in love with his mother-in-law, the Iktomi, and said, and that's forbidden. You don't, mother-in-laws don't talk to their son-in-laws. But he fell in love and wanted his mother-in-law. So he said, I'm going to war and I'm taking my mother-in-law. She's going to help me. <laughs> So they took off. And as it were, she put up her teepee. Remember, the teepee belongs to the woman. She put up her teepee and she was going to help. She really thought she was going to help her son in law like that at war. But he was out there, chan chan, machuita, osnielo, like that. So she had pity on him. Said, he said he was cold. And so she had pity and let him in her teepee. And as you know, it got a little carried away. And, Pretty soon they had children, <coughs> and one day they came back to the original tent, and he recognized his relatives. So he got on his horse, went riding into camp, and said, I came back from war, and I captured these children. <laughs> <laughs> his own children. And so the, the, the mother-in-law really, you know, she was truthful, and she told them the truth, <coughs> that those were their children. So that's... Iktomi the male, and there's Iktomi the female, where the mother fell in love with her son-in-law. And she knocked out her daughter and killed her daughter, thinking she killed her daughter. And they really looked alike, so she um, took the baby and went home, put her daughter's dress on, and the baby was crying and crying. Well, she couldn't breastfeed her because she didn't have any breast milk. And the father couldn't figure it out. You know, and finally he thought, I don't think this is my wife. So he went to where they were last, and he found, you know, he found um, her old dress, the the mother-in-law, and then he found his wife. She had she had just knocked her out. She didn't kill her. And so they came home, and of course, you know, they took care of business. But those kinds of stories teach us about relationships and how we should be with our relatives. So respect relationships. Son-in-laws don't talk to their mother-in-laws. Father-in-laws do not talk to their daughter-in-laws. But we don't obey that today, do we? Mm -hmm. I only know of two families that, that live that way. So, you know, that's the other thing. So this washicha way of in-laws, outlaws, 
that's not part of our culture. Um, our in-laws are valued because they're an uh, extended part of your family, and they exchange <coughs> gifts at the time they connect together. And I was really lucky that I, my grandson asked me to be part of his wedding. So after the preacher got done with his little sermon, I went ahead and threw out the Pendleton, had them stand there, got the water ready, got their star blanket, wrapped them, tied them together with leather, had their families come together and give each other water and welcome each other, gift each other so that they're one family now. And my grandson, he's uh, my natural daughter's oldest son. He had the placenta ceremony done for his children. He had the uh, transfer of character and the prophesying. The first one, my oldest grand great granddaughter, my daughter did. I did the prophesying for the little boy. He's named after my great grandmother's dad. Oh, he's named, my grandson's named after my great grandmother's dad. And, He's named after my great grandmother, Tashuke Ogile. And so Hans for his horse is his name, but his first name is Koda. Tashuke Ogile. Koda is not Lakota, but oh well. <laughs> it means friend, right? Kola in the D language, Koda. So <clears throat> I think it's real important. And even though my Kapojas could pass for Washijus, they're Lakota because of those ceremonies. And their mom, even though she's Washichu, she said, can you teach me the prayer that you taught my husband so I can teach my grandchildren? And taught her. So she's praying with them in Lakota. That's how important it is for those generations forward. So now my part is making sure Tapo just go through their ceremonies. And if I can't make it that far, at least I'll have a book for them. So this is who we are. This is where you come from. This is where you're going to go. This is how important it is. And please, please, we can. We can do anything and be anything that we want. It's up to you. It's up to you. That choice is yours. And I'm really thankful my parents taught us to believe in ourselves because it's possible. And these babies, when you treat these babies the way they should be treated, you're going to see some confident children with high self-esteem. I watch mothers and how they treat their children. You can see those that get the love, the nurturing, that human contact, that support and encouragement. You can see how well developed they are. And it goes back to their nutrition too. You know, as women, we're taught that we prepare the food, so we have to prepare ourselves. Don't cook when you're mad because you're going to feed that anger to your children. You're going to burn your food. And so this grandma, this grandma loves her grandchildren. She always prays for them every day, every day. And one day, you know, she made some soup for herself, enough just for her. But when she was praying, she thought about her grandchildren and what they were eating, because she didn't know how they were. And she prayed for them. And here. Those grandchildren showed up when her meal was ready. And there was five of them. And she made just enough for herself, maybe second helping. But her grandchildren were there, so she fed them. And you know what? They were full. What was the secret ingredient in there that made them full? Love. Love, exactly. And so remember that when you're preparing <coughs> to put that prayer and that love in there for your children. That's powerful. That's the energy. And that's the sacredness of these children. Wakan. <coughs> Wakanija. Even Wanikia, that Christ child, when he grew up, knew the sacredness of the children. Because the time before he went on the cross, he was contemplating. And he was talking to his father, God. And all the words he said, I, I, you know, I can imagine what he went through. But the children came to him, and his disciple tried to shoo them away. He said, no, 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 let the children come unto me. And I realized then, he knew the sacredness of those children. Because when they came to him, their energy is what helped him to make that decision to finally 
make your sacrifice so those children can live. Kind of like us and the sacrifice that we make at Sundance time to give of ourselves, our flesh, so that our children can live. So if you look at some things, we have some commonalities. And even some of those old ones will say, no, 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 you know what, he was here before, and, and he taught some of those things. Book of Revelations, look at it. There's some things you can interpret in Lakota. There's some chapter about horses. There's a chapter about the herb. So, you know, people interpret that Bible the way they want. And I don't know this uh, Wanikia, but I know the spirit. And that's what's important for me. And I was raised Catholic, but you know what? When it came time to pray, <clears throat> my grandpa sent me on the hill with my grandmas. And then my mom, before that, asked me to pray. So I said, Hail Mary, full of grace. And she got mad at me. I said, pray. Oh, 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 okay. Our Father who art in heaven. I asked you to pray. Gee, Mom, are you dying? Do you need to act a contrition? Do I need to go get Father? You know? You are Lakota. Pray in Lakota. From here. Through here. You know that's the hardest thing to do? Have you guys ever tried it? It's easy now, but back then, when I was young, that was hard because prayer was memorization, just like education. It's memorization. All your tests are based on memorization. Isn't that true? What really comes from here to here is the true knowledge and wisdom. So yeah, take all your learning, but use it. Use it to help not just yourself, but your people. That's wisdom. And that's why I'm here today. I'm here because of my great-grandmothers. I'm here because of my grandfather. I'm here because of my parents. I'm here because I made that choice to be here. And you are capable of making those choices to live a natural, healthy lifestyle. So we don't have to have those children that are alcohol and drug affected. Those are choices. I made a choice to be, to live this way. I made a choice to speak Lakota. I made a choice to have that worldview. Lakota. 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 You know, those, those are important for us. Because if we all learn this way and live this way, we're going to be a bunch of brown-skinned white people. Uh, <clears throat> These are good thoughts. Prayer, um, um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you guys, many of you guys, if you want to go to a sweat lodge or someplace, and if you want to learn to say those prayers, I think the second week I, I, we talked about the language and how we put it together. And I have a copy of that, I believe. I think I might have gave you guys a copy of that. Uh, it's a prayer that I put together for the language one classes. You remember it, Omar, Mariah? Anyway, <clears throat> that's available. That's available for you guys to, uh, to, to start utilizing it. And also, whenever you provide, or when you say, uh, Grace for, for meals. It's something attached to that too. So uh, it's, it's available. I'll have a copy of that for you guys and I'll bring that next week so you can start utilizing it. But then the other thing is the prayer songs. There's a lot of songs out there that we could translate for you that you can learn the lullabies and uh, you know, all the, the chants attached to that too. So I think we could. And it's, it's available. So if you need some help with some of those, we can. We could uh, put that together for you. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to singing, especially for us women, we have to sing in the feminine. Because mm -hmm. today, a lot of our women sing like men. And, and the language is spoken like the men because that's, that's what's out there. But we're women. And I was corrected, that's why I ran. 
sweat for Papa and his my mom and and uh, Mama's in there with us and she sang like men too. Yeah. So like she I was saying, there's medicine. Remember the four I said we have as common commonality all of us, but there's also four medicines that the men have and those come out during the sun dance time, during their humblecha time. And those are all the four that every school hangs up on the wall. Those belong to the men. Courage, generosity, wisdom, right? With bravery, those four. Those are the men's values. Women's values, I just got done talking about our medicine. Fruitfulness, faithfulness, industriousness, and hospitality. Those are the four medicines that the women work with, okay? So even though we have those in common, you know, we're of different genders, and every gender has their medicine. And your medicine comes out during, you know, the time you go on your vision quest and get your guidance, and then when you do your sun dance. And us, it's through womanhood, ishnati, and through hapa waka ye api throwing of the ball. And so there's there's those roles there, but how many people are, are doing those today? You know? And as women, we have seven rites of passage. And so some of us, like myself and my friend, were on our last one. And then we own the star. So that Big Dipper represents the seven ceremonies of our people and also the seven ceremonies that we all have to go through as men and women. It's important. So I have, um, um, maybe next time I'll bring those uh, that PowerPoint. I didn't know if you have that available or not, but if you had a projector, do a PowerPoint on the seven laws of the people, maybe next time. But um, one of the things that I was taught by my um, my my grandpa and the elders was that um, after some teachings, then they always say, "Oh, huh, So I incorporated. It's called a Belmont process after one of our elders from um, the Northwest. But um, it's what did I hear? What did I learn? How do I feel and what did I like? Okay, so um, that's what we're going to go through here. And so we're going to start again to the left. When you're in Lakota class or anything, it's always to the left. <coughs> yeah. Do you get those four laws for the men and four for the women? Or He's probably going to have them on the test. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's fruit, uh, fruitfulness, faithfulness. Um, the last one is industriousness. Uh -huh. Industriousness. Industriousness. Uh -huh. And hospitality. Uh, hospitality. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for the guys, what was it? Generosity, wisdom, courage, and respect. Bravery. Bravery. Yeah. You have to be brave. Remember, you're the warriors. <laughs> <laughs> Is, is there is there any questions about like um, faith? Uh, we talked about faithfulness, yeah, faithfulness, industriousness, industriousness, and hospitality. And hospitality. hospitality is the piece that um, we were taught that hospitality is a natural part of our character, and that means that when people come to our home, right away you welcome them in, you give them water, you give them food to eat, and you give to people. And I won't, that only happened to me twice on this reservation, twice. I went to pick up, my dad and I went to pick up my brother. He adopted a, a Arapaho girl who used to be married to John Haas. <laughs> but anyway, we went to go pick him up at Francis's house. And here, um, the, gra the grandma, uh, the, she, there's a big table like that. Boy, she brought out the food and fed us. And then Matoha and Lazata Khlana, she was back here, you know, rattling things, trying to do something back there. Adoha, she came out and uh, she gifted all of us. There was four of us from the family. She gave us gifts. I was like, wow. So some people still practice those things. And as women, that's when we go to womanhood, the first thing we make, we have to give it to an elder. So I was lucky I got um, I a, a purse like that that they were here, but it was the knife sheath that she gave me that she made. So, you know, so we're taught that generosity piece through those values. So that's our every way, everyday walk in life. So we're going to go ahead and go around the room and you're going to say what you heard or what you learned or how you feel or what you liked. Erin. Um, <coughs> no, 
Hachi Chopi, mm -hmm. calling him the spirit. Mm -hmm. Lumia, to be prepared to be prepared. We took him the way of life and we both made the rise and move. Okay, good one. All right. Um, and in the core culture, men and women are all equal. Mm -hmm. And we never lived alone, we lived together as one. Mm -hmm. And at 2 a.m., that clear door is open. Okay, good. Um, my daytime is for men and nighttime is for women. Okay, the women's medicines? No, the the be alert, the be alert of mind. The, um, the be alert of mind. Oh, be alert of mind, be alert of spirit. Be and strong hearted. Strong hearted, yeah. Okay. Take courage, the first one. Okay, good one. Um, the how like we're equal as men and women mm -hmm. and not like how the men are supposed to be higher. Mm -hmm. That and then um, the values for the women mm -hmm. and the men. Um, okay. I didn't know the women ones. Okay. And now I can. Now you know. Yeah. <laughs> good. good. Did you like the session? <coughs> okay. Good. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't know about the two o'clock a.m. windows. We are whatever. Okay. Um. What else? I had something, but I just forgot about it. Okay. All right. Yeah, mine would be like a feeling, like when I was standing around and smudging, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that was really nice. Okay, good, good. You know, um, as humans, we know when we're hungry because our stomach tells us it growls and we go eat, right? But when your spirit is hungry, what do you feed it? And the, your spirit got fed today, that's why it feels that way. So remember that. Your spirit is a living part of you, and you have to feed it too, right? So you just don't give yourself food, but you also smudge yourself. Sage gets rid of negative energy. Sweet grass brings good energy. Cedar also, same thing. And sometimes cedar costs spirit too. And we also have roots that we use. <coughs> Those are an important part of who you are. These kind of classes are going to connect you to who you are, and you need to make that connection. It's important. All right. Thank you. Mish, I, um, I, I really um, like the way that you um, said about the turtle, hmm. um, about suicide, not connecting with the spirit. I think these young kids need to really know that they have a spirit and to take care of their spirit, and I wish someone would would really um, get these kids together like you're on the radio. Mm -hmm. So if you can talk about suicide and let them know that once they kill themselves, they can't go on the other side. People tell them um, that if they do a ceremony, they can go. They acted like God <coughs> and took their own life. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if someone can talk to these young people about suicide and the importance of having a spirit that's within you. And then um, the throwing of the ball, the courtship and marriage, those I think are, are really a, a component that these young people should learn um, in terms of having a teoshpea, in terms of having um, their own homes, and if they incorporate um, all of these um, values and virtues that we learn as women, that we don't, um, we the first date, we don't automatically lay down with the guy and try to have a baby and, and continue to have kids. I think so. If maybe if you can present something to the young ladies, or maybe get with somebody that can um, can uh, offer you to to talk on the radio about suicide. I think that um, more people that talk about suicide, I think these young kids will probably take it. Mm -hmm. And then um, I like the 1978 uh, Freedom of Religion Act. I forgot about that. So. Um, and then uh, the mother's role, I, I really enjoyed that. I will feel a chit chat. I didn't know about the spirit world, opening at 3 a.m. And um, that 
the intro, the intro. Saying your name four times. Okay. To take your spirit with you. Okay. Good. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that I kind of learned a lot today of stuff I didn't know. Mm-hmm. And the whole process earlier of the shaking of the hands and feet and all mm-hmm. that, that was new. I've never done that. Okay. Never said my name four times. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the women are for nighttime and the men are for daytime. <coughs> and it was a good experience today. Okay, yeah. Oh, good. So if you notice, what color do men wear at sundance? Majority of them. Anybody Red. notice? Red. Red. Right. For the sun. At the place that I dance, we have to wear blue in that time. Oh, all right. Great. <coughs> um, when you describe like the structure of the teepee, so, like the poles are the mother, uh-huh. the cover is the father, and then the smoke flaps is the grandma and grandpa. And the stakes are the children. Uh-huh. And then um, the story you told about the cradle board and how the carriers now make the baby's back crooked. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, too bad. Some of us can't be inventive and create things that would be healthy for us. <laughs> to, you know, that's those of you that are going into business, <laughs> engineering. Cool. All right. Um, I learned how to say um, pray in Lakota. Mm-hmm. Say, Lakota will check you. Mm-hmm. And I learned that those stories about um, mm-hmm. that. Yeah. I learned about cooking while you're men. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Today the men cook, so they have to learn that too <laughs> to be in a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> and that's only because some of our women are lazy and don't want to cook. <laughs> Sometimes that's me, because I'm tired at the end of the day, and I say, gee, I don't feel like cooking, and if he doesn't cook, then I'll say, let's just go to Subway. <laughs> All right, next. Is that the spirit that's back here? Mm-hmm. I'm kidding, I don't know about that. Okay, cool. Um, I learned how to All right, that's good. <coughs> I really like just this whole experience listening to you and learning about the equality and how um, you're supposed to appreciate just appreciate everyone you don't know and even go like how women always help their men in high esteem is it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then um, just about how we were always about inclusion and it's not like that really anymore. You don't really accept a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You never you never excluded anyone. Right, right. Good. You listen well. <laughs> okay. I never heard the stories about like Domi making the mothers eat their kids. Mm hmm. Never heard that. Yeah. And I also enjoyed the symbolism of the TV. Okay. You're explaining it. Yeah. I remember songs are really important, like Marcel's always saying songs. So all of you, all of you are here because of your sacredness, because your mother in her prayer asked for that sacredness. And your father in his song welcomed you. So those songs are part of welcoming, part of all our honoring families, <coughs> all the way from the time we're born with lullabies to all the rites of passage ceremony <coughs> from childhood all the way through manhood to womanhood, the honoring songs and the healing songs, the spiritual songs, all an important part of healing all four parts of who we are. So those are sacred. Our language was sacred. So we have to be careful what we said because these could kill people. That's how sacred our way of life was. Even to put up that teepee, there was a ceremony for that teepee. Did you know that? There's a prayer before that teepee goes up. Just like our Sundance tree. There's a prayer before that tree goes up. Even before the camp was made. Oh yeah, 
Yeah. Won't go on us to have. Yeah. They have a blessing for the ground mm -hmm. where we're going to live at. And that was done by the grass dancers. Yeah, grass dancers and all the men's, uh, men's society. some of the men's societies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Probably the shirt wearers uh, who decided where we're going to camp, stuff like that. So those are all important parts of who we are and our culture, the sacredness of who we are and the language. You know, so if, if we could put that sacredness to you. See, I like what Black Elk said. In the old days when we were a strong and happy people, all of our power came to us from the sacred hope of the nation. And so long as the hoop was unbroken, the people <coughs> flourished. The flowering tree was a living center of the hoop, and the circle of the four quarters nourished it. The east gave peace and light, the south gave warmth, the west gave rain, and the north with its cold and mighty winds, gave us strength and endurance. This knowledge came to us from the outer world with our religion. Everything that the power of the world does is done in a circle. Even the wind in its greatest might whirls, sun, moon, earth around. Even the seasons form a great circle in their changing and always come back to where they were. The life of a man is a circle, from childhood to childhood, and so it is in everything where power moves. Even our teepees <coughs> were round like the nests of birds, and these were set in a circle. A nation's hoop, a nest of many nests, where the Great Spirit intended for us to raise our children. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. You think about when we were a strong and happy people. Are we happy today? Where's those smiles at? <laughs> Where's that laughter at? Come on, be happy, right? Don't worry about whatever is out there. You have control. Let's see, those are the things we're not teaching about, being healthy ourselves. We make those choices. Hey, I'm going to be happy today. I'm, this is excellent. This is awesome to get to know all of you, you know? And I'm going to tell you honestly, I love all of you. I love you for who you are. The young Lakota people, the future. Mm -hmm. Everything is bright out there for you. It's up to you. Really, it's up to you. You own it. Nitwaki. Owaki. Remember that word, Owaki. You can. <laughs> you can. Write it down. Huh? Owaki. Owaki. And we're not talking about Milwaukee. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about Owaki. All right. Um, <clears throat> I have to say my, my spirit feels settled from the smudge in. Uh -huh. And I'm showing the badness from the body. Okay. <clears throat> what I heard before is that um, from somebody in Rosebud that was a man, he told me that back in the day, he said women got another place because back in the day, women used to walk 10 feet behind their man because the man was superior. And I heard late what well, today is tell me that like men and women are equal. And what I heard from a another elder lady was that the women used to walk ten spaces behind the man because He's at protected. that time there was war and the man was ready to give his life for his family. Exactly. exactly. And <clears throat> so I thought I knew that was I learned that that was wrong. That he would just use um, power and control. Yeah. From this culture, <clears throat> then you're so I liked how um, when you said the men and women are equal and about the generosity because um, now these days people do learn a lot of generosity because it's just, you can't find it here hardly. I know, I know. And it's, and it's sad. Yeah. The, the medicines of the men and women, I like that also. Good. All right. So and I like that I can use all this and take it home and share it with my family. Yeah. And then you found, you found that auntie, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can call me, 407-9440. <laughs> and that's all of you. You found a grandma or auntie. Yeah. 407-9440. And listen to Keely, 9 to 10, every yeah, I got Monday. Down. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, next Monday, from 3 to 5, I'm going to be teaching traditional child rearing here. And I think it's this room, 1 to 2? Or is it that, that way? Okay. Yeah, so 
I'll be teaching that probably all of October. And those that attend all the class, you'll get a certificate. And that's good for a year. All right. All right. So, next. Oh, one more thing. Sorry. Huh? Sorry. Um, was there, um, is this for men too? Yeah, that's okay. for everybody. A certificate for what? Huh? A certificate for what? For parenting. Oh. Yeah, some parents need that or they're going to sit in jail, unfortunately. <laughs> That's how they're using that today. So, anyway, go ahead. Um, I'm going into social work and um, how you said we need someone to understand our minds more and to get knowledge from an elder mm -hmm. or from a medicine man. Okay, good. So can help. Exactly. Right. Good. Step. Yes. In the, in the old days, uh, everyone came together to help a family recover from someone that has lost a mm -hmm. And uh, our tribe is the only one that has the seven ceremonies. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> the woman shouldn't cook mad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't go home and tell your mom that. <laughs> <laughs> that that's it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I learned that <clears throat> your spirit talks to you sometimes, so you just gotta listen up. Mm -hmm. Go by kind of a gut feeling, I guess. Mm -hmm. Learned that Wahe, is that how you say it? It means family. Mm -hmm. Always stick together, help anyone you can. Mm -hmm. Milwaukee means you can, right? Right. Milwaukee, I can. All right, watch that. I learned about um, the stories about Ithomi, and I learned about the song for the women, mm -hmm. and the four words for the women. Okay, good. All right. Now here's, we have a few minutes left. This is going to be my last message to you because this is really important. And I hope I brought the stuff I needed to give you. If not, I probably have to go out to the car and get it. But I'll give it to myself. <coughs> but it's a cultural competence card. And these were developed in the 90s, no, 2000. 90, late 90s and 2000. I was part of the group that developed them with uh, Shannon Cross there and and the hunt and other tribal people throughout this country. And the cultural competence card is to help people understand native culture that have to like, mental health sent all those professionals over to work with our people because of the suicide or maybe a disaster and they all have to come like the disaster people that are here. Um, it's a culture card to help them understand who we are. But I brought it too for you because you need to understand who you are. Because if you do an assessment on yourself and say, okay, what do I know about my culture? I know I don't speak the language, but maybe I understand it this far. Or maybe you have the language, but that worldview. But if you have the language, you're going to have the worldview. Let me tell you that right now. Or maybe you don't have the language or the world, you don't have a think love for them. Or maybe, you know, what about those customary behaviors? Are they there? Do that assessment. Because on that cultural competence, cultural competence is a set of congruent behaviors, attitudes, and policies that come together in a system, agency, or amongst professionals that enables them to work effectively in cross-cultural situations. So, let's say some of our, your parents still spoke Lakota. And so, could you communicate with them if you don't, right? And so, if the majority of our people speak Lakota, how are you going to educate yourself so you'll be able to understand them? And that's a whole reason for this, but we're, we're leaving the Lakota behind today. And we need to bring it forward with us. So we have our bachelors and our masters and our PhDs in this white man's culture. Where is your bachelors and masters and PhD in Lakota? That has to be in balance. And so maybe you don't speak the language. Okay, well, next semester I'm going to take language one. 
and I'm going to take it till I complete all the Lakota languages. That's going to be my professional development. Maybe I don't understand how my elders think, so maybe I'd better get a mentor, one of my, maybe it's my grandma that can explain things to me. Or, or maybe um, I better take a Lakota culture class so I can understand more of the customary behaviors or something. I don't think they offer anything on family dynamics. Maybe that's what I should go offer at the college, just to say I could teach on Lakota family dynamics. It's an idea. But in your own professional development, because here's what's happening. At the end of this cultural competence continuum, it's like this. Right here at the bottom is destructiveness, and that's why the 1978 um, Freedom of Religion Act and the Indian Child Welfare Act happened because of the destructiveness of this federal government on taking our children and not allowing us to worship. And the language is the other part of that too. Because English is the primary language in this country, so it's not acknowledging the First Nations. I mean, we weren't even citizens until 1924 when they decided to make us citizens. But even at that, we're still left out of, out of a lot of things. Why do you think Obama's trying to make up for things? But, you know, he's, he's helping one group. But he asked, hopefully that one group can help everybody. But that's what I mean. Today, we're not inclusive. This group here, this group there, that group there. We have to come together and work together as Okicha, Okolapicha. <clears throat> Those were friendship societies. They helped each other. That's how I grew up. Okicha, helping each other. So cultural competence, that's the most destructive end. That's genocide. That's what our language, our culture, our way of life is taken away from us. The genocide, the wounded knee massacres, all those things. Genocide, okay, destructiveness. The next level is when we're <coughs> culturally incapacitated. And that's when <coughs> we believe that um, uh, our way is the right way, the white people's way. That's that. They do things to keep us from succeeding. Um, culturally blind, oh, we're all the same. We're not all the same. We're Lakota and they're Washichu. We might have some commonalities, but you have to acknowledge that we're not the same. Every one of us, even here, is not the same. Every one of you has a gift. Every one of you. And it's when we bring it together here in a circle that that power comes through and that understanding. See? So this circle is important. So that's being blind, ethnocentric, I only think right here. So those are the three levels. And you want to get Beyond that, pre-competence, when you're finding, finally learning about what cultural competence is. Oh, I gotta be better at who I am. Who I am as a Lakota person. And taking these kind of classes, language, you're doing that. There should be uh, MSW and PhD level on who we are, but we, we haven't even got there yet. You know, So it's up to you, create that. That's who we are as a people. We had to create our camps. We had to do a lot of things and they happened because of that spirit taking care of us. You need to find that. That creativeness is there. That is here, the sacredness of these words. You say it and it's gonna happen, right? You're gonna be successful. Keep saying it. I'm gonna succeed. Owaki, that's the spirit. You can. Okay, so being pre-competent and finally Competency, but you want to go to proficiency. But this isn't all going to happen at once when you get your PhD. It's a journey in life. And so as you know who you are, you come, become better at it, then you learn maybe another tribe. I want to learn how to speak Crow. I want to learn how to speak Navajo. I can say Yat eh. <laughs> I can say that pretty good. I eh? <laughs> have to learn more. All right. So that's the journey. If, if you don't know anything about cultural competence, hey, Google it. Google it, and you'll learn something. Okay, so educate yourself while here, but look out for your people. All right. I love you, and I'm going to miss you guys, but I'll pray for you every day. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can we shake your hand, and we will uh, disperse.
Apesar, sim, na pele da foto. Só que um pouco assim. 